We are here with Delbert Guerin. It is November 18th, 2013. Interviewers are Leah Smith and Peter Hall. Uh, so why don't you tell us how you got started working in the longshore industry? Well, after I got married, uh, up until then, I'd been in many jobs, uh, different types of jobs. Well, not many, but some quite a few. Yeah, but uh, my dad was already a longshoreman. He started in 1935 uh, working with the North Shore Indians uh, and the North Shore Natives in 1936 amalgamated with Vancouver, uh, which later on became five local 500. Originally it was 501. And uh, I don't, I can't remember the exact year when we changed to 500. To, so anyhow, my dad started after me when I was in high school, Christmas time to go down. I could have gotten registered then, uh, but like a dummy, I didn't do it. So after I got married in 1960, uh, after the fishing season finished. Uh, my dad suggested actually that he should come down and try and get out on the waterfront. Uh, so that is why I started going down there. And at, at that time, you had to sit there and wait and wait and hope they would uh, run out of workers. So gradually, then I got, but at that time, they called it a disc. You just threw in a tube, and uh, after they finished all the people higher ranked than you, they came to the disc. Sometimes we'd get four hours in one week, sometimes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we'd get more. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, because of my uh, involvement in the fishing industry, I uh, was uh, able to collect uh, well, unemployment insurance, they called it them days. Uh, so it helped us get along. And uh, before good, good fortune is when I got registered. 1961. It went from there to 64 when I finally, late 64 when I got taken into the union. Just luckily those days uh, there was a father-son sort of a agreement. Uh, it wasn't in writing, written form or anything, but uh, it helped you uh, after you got registered to move up. And uh, with my father being a longshoreman, naturally, mm -hmm. it was of assistance to me. And uh, from there, uh, I was doing mostly, well, just labor down in the holds of the old uh, freighters. Uh, and, uh, oh God, in those days, the work we were doing was something else. I mean, Carry 180 pound sacks on your shoulders, stowing them into the uh, deck level, starting down on the uh, bottom deck and then moving up. Most of the ships at that time had three decks on them. And sometimes uh, we would even, uh, in, in the cases of lumber, be uh, loading on deck. And uh, all by 64. 65, they started packaging lumber, and uh, in those cases, they started using a front uh, lift truck uh, down the hatch to load the uh, lumber. So, 1965, I got qualified for training on the lift truck and started from there and moved into all different kinds of machine operating equipment, uh, which was interesting, especially the, as the ships started changing. It was the old ships, you had old cranes that uh, they required two, two drivers uh, and the hatch tender standing on the deck there to give you signals for tide was uh, real high and you couldn't see the dock and 
making sure when we're going down below that uh, if uh, it's out of our sight that uh, we'd be able to, he would be able to guide us with his hands and whatnot and things like that. It's nice if, uh, in some cases, uh, as time went on, it progressed to where even though they kept still kept dispatching two two crane two uh, winch operators uh, in the hatch tender, they brought the brought it together where the two hand handles were side by side, so you, one guy could do the operating, and uh, that was a, a nice start. And as time progressed, things just kept changing and. Came in with ships with cranes on them uh, in the middle of the decks, and uh, you still had a hatch tender guiding. And then uh, they came in with gantry cranes uh, where they rode back and forth in a little cab uh, to the dock down below in the hatch. and. Uh, and then the crane could move back and forth in the hatches and go from hatch to hatch uh, in front of the uh, pilot house and everything else. Or if you're happy to be on the rear end, uh, if you'd be on the rear end, uh, they'd have those there back there too. But most of them, as time progressed, the uh, Steering cabin and everything, uh, their mess uh, r room and everything else, their quarters were all right in the stern of the ship, so the hat hatches were all in front. And some of them uh, started out six hatches, then seven, sometimes eight hatches. So ships started changing quite, quite a bit uh, by the end of the 70s. And... Uh, this was mostly on the South Shore of Burrard Inlet that you were working on. Yeah, okay. well, South Shore and the North Shore. Because mm. you got North Shore, you've got Vancouver Wharves, Lynn Terminals, and uh, Seaboard. Well, those were three main docks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was another little dock, and I can't think of its name now. I don't know why, but uh, it was right close to the shipyards that mm -hmm. produced the ships during the war. Mm -hmm. It was just east of uh, the last shipyard. Mm -hmm. When did those gantry cranes come in? Mm, which, the big ones? Yeah. Oh, in the 70s. Okay. And I got my, I started getting, I got trained on those in 70, late 75. That was my favorite toy, I always say. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I never realized like we used to, have to climb up, and I'd come to the stairs and 190 steps up, and I used to run up. That was my exercise, daily exercise, running up 190 steps. And uh, oh, I don't know what year it would have been now. Uh, 19 85 and 90 when they put elevators on them. Mm -hmm. it took away my exercise actually, <laughs> which was unfortunate to me. So approximately how long did you work for? I was down there for 41 years. 41 years. So from 1961. 1961 you were registered. Mm-hmm. I retired in 2003. Didn't have enough hours one year to qualify for a year, so I, I, I was recognized as 41 years oh, on the yeah. waterfront. Oh. What happened that one year? Didn't get enough hours. But why was that? Just right at the bottom of the scale uh, in where, where we were putting our our di little discs into this yeah. little tube, you weren't getting that much work. Mm -hmm. So about how many hours a week did you work? Well, in the early days, uh, five and five and a half days, uh, 
I can't remember what year it was that things changed, but uh, in the early stages it was a five-day week, and Saturdays naturally was overtime. Sundays you didn't work. And as time went on, uh, they started recognizing Saturdays uh, as a work day, uh, even though it was time and a half pay. And uh, working at nights, uh, we uh, got time and a half for working nights. If we happened to work graveyards, which wasn't too much in the early years, uh, you got double time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then in 68, Trudeau didn't actually legislate a contract on us, but uh, he did, uh, in effect, impose some clauses in there. And that's when the port opened seven days a week, three shift operation. And from that point on, oh God, I was working seven. Most time, most time, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I smashed my leg in 1975 coming down the Squamish Highway mm -hmm. from working up there. A little too much. A little too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Came down the long hill at Furry, Fort Furry Creek. And I got around the first corner. And I dozed off and I hit the pole in the second corner and compound fractured my femur. Mm -hmm. I didn't have my seat belt on, I got thrown across and took the gear shift right out with my leg. Mm. So did that affect your work? I was off for a year and a half. Uh. So during this time, um well, you travel you travelled to Squamish to work. W were you living here, Masquerade? Yep. So you you lived here all your life, pretty much. Well, we I lived my first fifteen years in uh, North Vancouver, on the Mission Reserve, uh -huh. and that, like I say, er, said earlier, is where my dad got involved with the uh, Longshoremen's local uh, and the natives had a, had their own local at that time for. Mostly working on the North Shore. Is that what they called the bows and arrows? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Local five hundred one. Mm, they became part of nine five hundred one uh, in thirty five, thirty six. That's when they had the big strike and uh, had a riot at Ballantyne Pier. People, some people got hurt pretty seriously. Yeah. So you spent your first fifteen years there, and your and your dad was working on the on the water, and and, and then and then after that. Well, we moved home because uh, my grandmother passed away in 1951, and she was living in the house that my dad built up close to Marine Drive uh, on a piece of land that he owned up there, because his mother's house and dad's house was over here, where. There's no houses there where, where their house was now. But the old church was over there, and they were right across from the church. Mm -hmm. And my dad's oldest brother got married, and he moved his wife into that house. And well, I guess my grandmother and uh, her daughter-in-law weren't getting very along very well at how they wanted to manage the household work and, and the kitchen work and everything else. Mm -hmm. So my dad made pretty good money up in Rivers Inlet, uh, and the Fraser River fishing in 1929. So he built a house up there and he moved his mom and dad up there. And he's well, one of his older brothers that never did get married. And uh, when my mom and dad got married in 1936, that was after my dad had started longshoring over there. Uh -huh. He went with another lady over there first before he got with my mother. When they got married in uh, October uh, 36, she said to him, well, Vic, if you want to move home to your mother, your house over there, you, you go ahead and say to your mom and dad, but I'm going to stay over here because I, I get along very well with your mother when we're visiting. 
But I don't think we get along in the kitchen, so, uh, so we st stayed over there. And I was going to the St. Paul's Residential School. So, like I say, I, I went to the residential school for 10 years. My mother, uh, when I was born, I was 11 and a half pounds. And uh, it caused my mom heart problems. And uh, she was bedridden for a while. So I got sent to school at uh, about just I turned five and f 43. So I got sent to the, as a very young person into grade one. And uh, because of that, they held me back one year. Mm -hmm. Then in grade three, I ended up with a uh, gland problem in my uh, hip area here, just where the bone femur meets the uh, bone up there. There's a gland there. And I was in the hospital for three months, so I got held up in grade three as well. Mm. And uh, so I spent 10 years in that school. And uh, like I say, my grandmother died in 51, but I think because I was still going there, the, as a to the residential school as a day scholar, uh, my mom and dad decided to stay the next two years in order to have me continue to be a day scholar rather than a boarder. Mm -hmm. And because uh, my mother had been you know, a boarder in, in St. Paul's residential school in its early years, and my father was a boarder over in Cooper Island residential school uh, in his early years, and. Uh, they knew the kind of treatment that uh, our, our, our children, young people were receiving in the, in those schools. So, they for you. Yeah, so yeah. that's why they basically, I think, stayed till 53. I started at Lord Bing High School here uh, up on 16th and Wallace in 53, grade 9, because the only... Uh, choice I had at the time to, was uh, if I was going to continue residential school, would be to go to Mission or Kamloops, Seashelt or Port Alberni, and uh, between my mother and I, we decided uh, I, would go, I would go to Lord Bing mm -hmm. or go to school public school, I should say. My sister had already started public school in North Vancouver. My older sister, who passed away in 1991. And interestingly, uh, we never moved till October, I can't remember exact date, uh, 53. But I came from North Vancouver to Lord Bing High School for a month and a half. Which was quite an ex interesting experience. Mm. Then I guess I was in grade 10 when my dad told me at Christmas time, you know, you should uh, come down the hall for the 4 o'clock dispatch. Uh, when you get to the school, you'll get down there just in time. You make some money down there. You know, it was too chicken. I, could, I just couldn't make myself do it, you know. I don't know why. But uh, nevertheless... As it is, uh, like I say, in 61, after I was married, uh, and uh, I worked in the cannery in Steveston, uh, B.C. Packers uh, Imperial Cannery, for, oh, about a month after the fishing season had come to an end. And the seasons were shortening up, as a matter of fact, by that time. So as it turned out, uh, in 62, late 62, that's the last year I went up to River Zealand, as a matter of fact, on the fish collector. I was working on a fish collector with my uncle, which I started in 57. He was eat skipper, and I was a deckhand, and I did most of the work. <laughs> that was sailing out of where? Well, we started, uh, we used to tie up here in Celtic Shipyard, and then we'd start the season in Rivers Inlet, which is 250 miles up the coast. 
and uh, we'd be there. First year we were there till oh, end of September, I guess it was, when they moved us down, and we ended up in Deepwater Bay, just above uh, Seymour Narrows. And then the season came to an end, and uh, at that time the Shaanxi Golf Course was still being in, installed. Uh, it's, the agreement with them uh, commenced in January the 1st, 58, and uh, I went down and got a job and worked down there, uh, digging ditches and everything else. Mm -hmm. Then when I came back after the fishing season, uh, well, before the fishing season started, actually, I ended up running a, a backhoe. And uh, I don't know how I got chosen for it, uh, but I mastered it pretty quick. But I still went out uh, back out on the boats with my uncle. And when I came back after the fishing season was finished, uh, I went back there and they put him right back onto the backhoe. So I did that uh, for that year. 59, uh, when I came back, uh, I was basically living on unemployment insurance after the fishing season finished. But it used to go till end of October pretty well in those years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd start in Rivers Inlet and end up down, down here collecting fish for the balance of the season. Just a, this is not at all about uh, the river and about longshoring, but when you were collecting fish in those days, uh, did you have a refrigerator on the ship, or were you? Oh no, you, no, you, not you no. You got things. an ice. You got packed up with ice. No, not in the pa not in the fish collectors. Uh, in, the, uh, they, in those days, they didn't. But uh, when fish went out to the packer, then they had ice on there. So you, so you, on the fish collector, you would drop it off every couple of days at some every cannery? every day. Every day, you take it into a cannery. No, we'd bring it. In. The packer would be sitting down in in the case of BC packers in Wadhams. Outside, originally it was Wadham's Cannery, but at this stage it wasn't a cannery, uh, operating cannery anymore. So we'd deliver there, and the fish would go to Namu, where the can there was a PC Packers Cannery in Namu, yeah. and some of it would get shipped down to Imperial Cannery and on the main river. So every day, every day you're basically transferring your your load. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Because we, we, we've heard about people, um, uh, same time period, um, I think with um, it, with Gillies maybe out of New West. Oh yes. And they would and they would get loaded up with ice, and then they would go out and they'd come back. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they were in salmon. I think they were in severe. Maybe they were in halibut or something. Oh yes. Does that sound right? I'm not sure. I haven't heard of Gillies. I didn't hear Gillies Cannery. Oh, I, I, yeah, I don't, it wasn't a cannery. I think it was. I think it was the same crowd that became the, the tug in, in the end. Oh yeah. Um, but anyway, they would they would they would load up ice on the vessels and then mm -hmm. they'd be So this was a different. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and the uh, same thing, same problem in this minister uh, happened in Vancouver as well, where. Because it got to a point in Westminster where men were given a, their 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 choice to either be a fisherman or a longshoreman, one or the other. They couldn't be both. Uh -huh. And uh, as a matter of fact, in '62, uh, that's the choice that I was given. And as it turned out, it was my my uh, oh, dad's oldest brother's wife's. Uh, nephew who gave me the choice of moving from that little disc thing that I talked about to onto what was called the 8,000 board. Uh, and he said, we'll move you up to Albert on one condition, that you quit the fishing industry. you got to be either a longshoreman or a fisherman, one or the other. It's your choice. 
and the seasons were shortening. Uh, in Rivers Inlet, when I first went up there in 57, it was all five-day weeks, five-day fishing week uh, all the way through the season. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm not sure, it was 59 or 60 when they started cutting back to four days. And then uh, it, got, it started getting a little worse in 61 because they started letting seine boats come into the river's inlet, which wasn't allowed in the early days. Mm -hmm. And naturally, that was wiping the fish out. So, like I say, I was given the uh, choice of uh, staying in the fishing industry or becoming a full-time longshoreman. So why did, why did they give you? Why did? Why do you think? Uh, who, where did that choice come from? Who was? Who was? Who was? Uh, who, why were they? Why, why did they force you to make that choice? Well, it was. It was a decision of the. Uh, well, the board of directors, so the elected officials of the board, uh, representing the local five hundred and. Uh -huh. That time well, 501 it, it was in those days, and gradually the uh, dock section of the uh, waterfront and the ship section amalgamated into one mm -hmm. as five local 500. And uh, they just decided that uh, people had to make that decision, uh, it couldn't be just part time, but one and the other. So I did, uh, as I said, and that went on till 76. And then my friend, uh, late Arnold Rakelma, Bud Rakelma, as he was, he was the nickname they called him by, he salvaged a boat on, on Qualicum Beach. He, he was chief of the Qualicum Reserve. Phoned me, he said, are you interested in a gillnetter? He says, uh, just salvaged one. Oh, he said, yeah, it's got a hole in the, in the uh, hull, uh, but uh, what happened was the guy had completely refurbished everything, sent somebody else out to the boat, and uh, we know darn well what the intention was, was to go and run it up on the shore and collect the insurance <laughs> and move into the newer style boats that were coming out. So that's what he did, what he'd done, and... Uh, what uh, Arnold Kirkelma did was he just got the boat put onto a, a trailer and uh, the truck towed it over and brought it to my right to my house up the hill here. And gradually we uh, had a boarder come into the house who who had done a lot of boat work and everything else. Oh, yeah. So he patched it up and everything. And uh, as it turned out, my cousin was on, working for the Department of Fisheries. And I ended up getting a fishing license. So I started fishing part-time in Longshore, part-time uh, in 76. And how... I was uh, doing that in secret. Yeah, I was going to say, how did the, the local react to that? Yeah, well, they, they didn't really... I think they suspected what was going on, but mm -hmm. uh, they weren't saying anything because by that time I was running all kinds of equipment on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. uh, all the different ship cranes and everything else, and the new cranes and lift trucks all over the docks and ships and everything else. So, because by that time, things had been quite become quite mechanized on the ships, and uh, then I got into front end loaders and gradually got to, to operating an excavator and loading. That's been my last ten years. As a matter of fact. At Vancouver Wharves, which is okay. uh, beside the Lionsgate Bridge. How did you get to work every day? Drove in a car. Okay. It's taking about half an hour to get over to Van North Vancouver. Okay, not too bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I learned, learned, learned all kinds of shortcuts through alleyways and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so you, you, you did at least you did some traveling up to Squamish. Yeah, I uh, found when I was chief uh, of this band from 
73 to 82, I was also uh, involved with the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Mm -hmm. And being a longshoreman, I was doing a lot of traveling uh, back east uh, for the, was for the na national uh, level, the National Indian Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Because being a longshoreman, I was able to get time off uh, with, without too much trouble. Uh, and uh, as long as you maintained your 800 hours per year, uh, there, there was no problem. It was really interesting because the fellow used to be head dispatcher when we were in the in the old dispatch hall in Gore. He'd moved moved up uh, into the office. He phoned and uh, his loud voice. He says, "That's Dalbert." I recognized his voice right away, and he's loud, loud howl. He says, "Were you sick last year?" Oh, a couple times. What dates? I said, oh, i got to look at my book just a minute. So I got my book out and showed, found it, so I told them, okay, I'll put you down for sick leave. Uh, you were three hours short for <laughs> your pensionable year. Huh? You lost the pensionable year, but it's fixed all up now. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, uh, so, so to maintain your 800 hours, I guess you were picking up jobs in various places. Yeah. But never on the river? Once in a while we came over to the river uh, when there was no work in Vancouver. Uh, we'd come over. Uh, sometimes they would dispatch us right from our dispatch hall. And other times uh, when it was slack in Vancouver, uh, uh, they would, uh, the dispatchers would be talking back and forth with the where the dispatch office out in Stephen Westminster would phone down and say we need men, so some bunch of us would speed out there and go to work out there. So once in a while we did do a work on mm -hmm. on both sides of the river. Can you tell us about some of the jobs you did out on the river? Oh, mostly loading lumber. Uh, A lot of it on the south side of the river uh, where the big cranes, uh, mm -hmm. duck, uh, gantry cranes they call them. So we worked uh, that pretty well that side a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Once in a while on the main, main uh, on the Northminster side, there were t docks stretched right along, but uh, because of the development that was advancing within the city of Westminster, it was kind of slowing down, slowing down on the, on the uh, north side of the river. And uh, gradually, on Adams's Island, that uh, those dog docks opened up there too, where they, I was unloading cars. You did some of that? Yeah. I did that, yeah. Oh yeah, we used to love, love to speed off the sail fast we could drive those brand new cars. Mm -hmm. And so this was mostly after 75 when the gantry cranes were introduced. Were they introduced at the same time? In uh, the gantry cranes uh, actually started out uh, on the co coastwise operation. And... Uh, That dock was down close. I don't know if you know where the old cannery old restaurant used to be. It shut down a couple of years ago. Mm. Which restaurant? The cannery? Cannery, yeah. Uh, in um, uh, in the yeah. Below Wall Street. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And there was a dock over there, terminal dock. Mm. And uh, that terminal dock, we worked a lot, a lot of, uh, especially... They had a contract with Russia in 59-60, so we were loading a lot of uh, wheat in those days at that dock. And that was with gantry cranes? No, oh, okay. not that time, but the uh, coastwise operation just over beside the cannery were the ones, first ones to set up a uh, uh, small gantry operation. 
and uh, they also uh, started the containers. Mm -hmm. But as they went up and down the coast, uh, naturally, mm -hmm. they had to use just the uh, cranes on the docks mm -hmm. of the fishing companies and everything that they delivered to mm -hmm. in Rivers Inlet and Namu and further up. And uh, why do you think the coastwise operation? were the first to get into the gantry? I don't know. Some Somebody uh, came up with the idea. One of the longshoremen himself uh, uh -huh. came, came up with the idea, apparently. I can't remember the fellow's name. And then as time progressed, uh, naturally the Asians got wind of it, and uh, pretty soon they started uh, at... Uh, oh... Dock at the foot of Corn of uh, Gorse. Why can't I think of the name? <laughs> Centennial Pier. Oh, yeah. That's where they started from. And then uh, after that, uh, cranes, uh, cranes operating there and everything, and the space became too limited, so. They actually filled in at the foot of Clark Drive where uh, Van Term is uh, right, right, right. in that big area there. And there you've got seven uh, big cranes. Yeah. And uh, in the early stages they used uh, tractor trailers uh, that could uh, continue. We'd drive right over the gantry, the the containers, and uh, pick them up, right. and store, go and stock, store them. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the times uh, I went on my, I was on the on drive operating the crane, and uh, I can't remember what year that would be now. Uh, late 70s, early 80s, I'm not sure now. Anyhow, this fellow, uh, in, uh, when you're operating that that um, piece of equipment, you're on one side only. Mm -hmm. And he had to go up this one lane to go and place the container because the checker uh, who was halfway on the, up on the crane would have it marked out on paper and he'd have it marked down exactly where it was to be stowed on the dock so that when the trucks came in to pick the cargo up, uh, they'd know exactly where to go to pick the containers that they were scheduled to uh, take to whatever site uh, it was going to oh, off the docks. Anyhow, this fellow uh, was really in a hurry, so he didn't bother going down and putting a marker at the, at the end there, uh, this fellow named Jim, I can't give you the last name in my head right now. Uh, in fact, he was good friends with my brother-in-law, who just lives up the hill, Jim Martin. He went flying up, this dropped the container off in its spot, back right out, and uh, somebody discovered that uh, Fellow got run over both ways, totally crushed. And I got back to the dock after my break, and they told me, "Well, you're not going back up because we're shutting down for the day. Uh, so and so just got killed. He was crushed by one of the straddle carriers, is what they called them." And uh, they told me who was driving it. Uh, and how upset he was and everything naturally. And he's, the fellow's sons were longshoremen as well, and uh, well, they were so mad, they were hoping to catch him and they wanted to kill him. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the way they felt about it. Sure, sure. But it wasn't his fault. I mean, the guy didn't, didn't do father, follow proper procedures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were there a lot of accidents like that? Mm, not too, too many. Uh, 
North Van, uh, as a matter of fact, at Vancouver Wharves, uh, had one serious accident where this fellow walked behind his lift truck after the lift truck had brought his load out and uh, was backing out, or actually he was stowing it in the in the shed, and he was backing out, and this guy he just walked behind him while when the guy as he started backing out, and he actually crushed him against a pillar, sure. things like that happened. Another fellow, uh, when they had the ship gantry cranes, uh, which basically uh, had two arms on each side of the ship, uh, so he brought the, if, if the cargo was going on the dock, you went onto the dock, or if it was going onto a scow, you went the other way. Mm-hmm. And uh, Gaines was at Centennial Pier, and I can't think of his name now, I can see, I can almost see his face uh, and everything. but. Uh, he was actually foreman, but he was helping lash down the uh, containers that were on the uh, deck. And uh, one of the crew members went up into the crane and uh, decided to move the crane forward because they had some kind of work they wanted. To. It was right down at the, uh, just in front of the wheelhouse. And the guy, the crane came up and just crushed him against the. Uh, against the containers in, in the arm of the uh, st- straddle carrier crane. And, and that was a sad one. For so one of the, you, you said that one of the people involved in this accident lives just up the road, so I presume uh, he, he's also a member of the, of the nation? That's well, no, the, the fellow that was... Martin? Uh, Jim Martin, no, he was, a, he was Caucasian. He was Caucasian. He lived up on Mayfair, actually, oh, okay. just just east of Dunbar. Okay. So, how many how many other <coughs> how many other First Nation guys were working with you? From here. From here, from other from other. From here, places? Uh, my dad and I were basically in our era the only ones, and then my son started after. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I registered my youngest son when he was fifteen. Okay. He had a lie. Mm. He changed his birth date uh, yeah, that later on when he got into the union. And the for- I mean, the dispatchers knew damn well I was lying. Yeah. Mm. Him and my uh, nephew. So at this stage, I got two sons still working down there, and my nephew. He's he's actually a foreman now, and makes good money because they get double shifts and everything else. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm. And, uh, Did you get your nephew in there? Yep, I got him registered as well. He was under age too. Mm-hmm. And from other from other nations. In North Vancouver, the Squamish Band, uh, you had a lot of uh, uh-huh. longshoremen from there, which was naturally a follow up from their own local that they had, uh-huh. where they were loading ships on the North Shore all the time. Which is how my dad actually got started, and, right, right. and then, like I say, in 1936, they amalgamated with Vancouver. Mm. But um, one of the things that we we're not sure about is is, is whether there were any um, um, First Nations guys working on the river. Do you do, do you know of any? Mm, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't out there that often. I, I didn't have the opportunity to see anybody. But I did hear stories of uh, somebody from Chowasin working and somebody from Langley, mm-hmm. but that's about the only ones I heard about. Uh, mm-hmm. And interestingly, I can't remember the exact year now. Whether it was the 60s or the 70s, early 70s, when there was an attempt to work out a deal mm-hmm. where Vancouver and Newest Minster would amalgamate into one. And uh, it got voted down in the end by both Newest Minster and Vancouver. Mm. But a, a small margin in, in Vancouver, but a large margin in what, Newest Minster. Mm-hmm. Which basically, in my mind, would have been probably a good 
a good deal of it had happened. What were the reasons for yeah. opposition? Oh, just the idea that the newest minister guys, most of them lived out that way. Mm. And they just didn't like the idea that they have to drive all the way to Vancouver all the time and mm -hmm. so on. Whereas where our people, so they lived all over the big circle, mm -hmm. Surrey and Coquitlam and, uh, you know, just all over the place. Mm -hmm. So you had the sense that um, workers in New Westminster wanted to stay in New Westminster. There was quite a strong yeah, sense of Yeah, that seemed that was, that, was, that was the way I heard, well, it's the way I assumed things because of the results of the votes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, um, from uh, from our project, we're really looking at the period after 1945, but uh, we do know that um, uh, in the 1930s and 40s, they had a pro policy in New West that uh, after the strike, you had to live in New West to work in New West. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's almost as though that kind of... Um, that kind of idea is still maybe not around today, but it, you know, definitely it was a strong idea in the past that it was, you know, it was a kind of a, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say closed, but it was a kind of a mm -hmm. you know, separate kind of thing. And originally, the way the agreement was between Vancouver and New Westminster was uh, where they were on the uh, river water, that was their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ours was on the salt water, mm -hmm. and uh, interestingly, uh, one of the fellows really followed up, and I just can't even think of his name right now either. He was the head of negotiations for who would take jurisdiction of Port Moody, or who would take jurisdiction of Delta Port, mm -hmm. and uh, technically, as far as we were concerned, we felt we should get Delta Port because it was on the salt water. Mm -hmm. He, uh, our representative, went in favor of uh, going for Port Moody, and as it turned out, it uh, more or less flopped out. Because mm -hmm. as time progressed, uh, things became, became more mechanized and the number of workers there. Was that in the 1980s or was that as late as the 1990s? Uh, I believe it was in the 80, 70, late, late 70 or early 80, somewhere around that period. I can't remember exactly. So, uh, so you the guys, 80s, I guess. Yeah, maybe, well, it could have been earlier. You guys, you guys were probably thinking salt water is ours, and they were probably thinking Port Moody is ours because uh, PCT moved there. Could be. Does that sound right? To you? I guess so, but uh, we end up with a jurisdiction over Port Moody, yeah. and they, they ended up with jurisdiction over yeah. Delta Port. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to me, that was a big mistake. But uh -huh. Uh -huh. nevertheless, what transpires transpires in the long run. Would you have, Would you have liked to have worked down in uh, Delta Port? Pretty convenient from here. Yeah, not bad from here, but uh, it would have been a longer drive than anything, anything for me to hear other than when I was working up Squamish. And the only reason I went up Squamish steady, uh, like I said earlier, was because of my involvement in our provincial politics and uh, the band politics. Mm -hmm. And up there it was on phone dispatch, so I didn't have to go to the dispatch hall every day and things like that. So it made it convenient if I wanted to take time off, I just phoned in replacement and things like that to go and do the other jobs, which unfortunately I wasn't getting very pay, paid very much to do. Not like things are today for our Indian politicians. They get paid pretty, pretty good today, which is, which is good, mm -hmm. you know, because of the work they are doing. But we were getting $35 a day when when I'm talking to back in the '69, after the white beaver policy that Trudeau passed 
to try to make us into no longer in having Indian status, as it mm -hmm. is stated. Mm -hmm. And we had a big rebellion over the whole thing, and it, it gradually was just thrown out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I didn't grow up in Canada, so I don't know if it's, do you prefer if I say Indian or native? Well, basically, we were called Indians right up to uh, before three years ago when they finally changed it to Aboriginal. Okay. Yeah. What do you prefer? You don't care? I don't really care because we've been <laughs> recognized as Indians ever since I can remember. Mm -hmm. Remember, and my dad's, since he can remember. Because, you know, uh, Christopher Columbus thought he'd reached India. Yeah. I tease the East Indians quite a bit. As a matter of fact, it was really interesting. Saturday, I brought my grandson to a doctor's office. I don't know how he uh, got linked with this doctor's office on Fraser Street, uh, between 43rd and 44th. And uh, I brought him there, and I dropped him off, and I hadn't eaten, so I went up to the 41st, the KC chickens up there. So I went and got a little box full of 20 nugget chickens and came back and just conveniently there was a parking space right in front of it when I got back. So I ate a bit and uh, drinking my cold drink and left his head and got him a drink and was sitting there as well and I thought, you know, I got to go to the bathroom so cause I take water pills every morning. Uh, I've been for quite a while now because of heart problems. And uh, I went in, found the bathroom right away, very convenient. Come back to the door, and uh, this fellow uh, is pulling the door just a bit. Get it open, but he much. So I pushed on the door, and he starts speaking to me his language. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm sorry, I can't understand that. He repeated himself. I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand your language. He repeated himself again, so I said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. So I pushed by him, mm -hmm. and I went and climbed into the truck again. I looked back and he, he opened the door and went inside and he looked around a little bit and he came back out and he went to a vehicle that was uh, a couple of cars, a couple ahead of me. He climbed back in. I thought, oh my God, did, did that guy think I was one of his people? <laughs> he didn't think I'm not that dark. <laughs> but uh, it was really comical. This happened actually in the vehicle. Ed, Ed Van Term, uh, I was going there for a graveyard shift, and uh, I walked into the lunchroom, and I just, it's, it's almost the same size as this. The door's in the far corner, like, uh, it's a little longer than this, actually. I didn't really glance to, the, to my side, I just looked over, and all the guys I know for sitting at one table, the other crane operators. Oh, yeah. So I go over and I'm BSing with him and our little Italian foreman comes in and he's about 5'7 or something like that. short, he's very short for a man. He, uh, he looks up and his nickname's Bambi. I don't, I, don't even, I don't even know what his real name is because all, all we ever call him was Bambi. Delbert, Delbert, he says to me. I said, what? What are you doing talking to these guys? Why aren't you over there talking to your relatives? I turn and I look. It's all Indians from India. Mm. And I look back, and the little guy, one of the guys, is ready to burst out laughing. His face is just beaming. Hey, Bambi. He said, What? And the guy stopped. I said, You know what? He said, What? I'm just so glad that, you know, when Queen Isabella sent Christopher Columbus out, yeah, she told him to look for India, not, and I paused. One of the two of the guys really started laughing right away because they figured I was going to... I said, yeah, not Italy, otherwise I'd be called Italian. <laughs> the whole room just roared laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Including the uh, Indians from India. Right. The whole works were just roaring laughing. Mm. And uh, we, he has to come back and drive me out to the crane because we're not allowed to walk out with all the equipment around. Because mm -hmm. that law became very strict after that accident where the fellow got killed. So anyhow, uh, climb into his vehicle to drive me out. Why you do that to me, Delbert? Why you do that to me? I, said, I didn't start the band, but you started it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so back in the day when they had bows and arrows, it was, um, you know, different, if I understand correctly, the different gangs 
there was, you know, there were like native or Indian gangs, mm -hmm. and there probably were also Italian gangs and, you know, people. Um, mm. Not so much. I never heard so much about anything like that, and uh, the bow and arrows uh, really worked the North Shore. Okay. That, uh, oh, it's got a new name on it now. The Wheat Poo. Uh, Saskatchewan or the Viterra? It's next door to the Saskatchewan, on this side of Saskatchewan. Okay. And it was the only wheat pool over there at the time. Okay. And then uh, there was another dock, as I say, close to east east of the uh, shipyard. Uh-huh. And Mid those... June. Over that side? No, no. East, east, east of Lonsdale, just oh, a couple yeah. blocks east of Lonsdale. There were the two docks, basically, on, the, on that shore. Uh, and where the shipyard was uh, on the west side of the old North Vancouver Ferry Terminal. Once in a while they'd work on a, on a ship there as well. But uh, places like Vancouver Wharves uh, didn't start until quite a while later that it was all filled in. Before that it was actually it was the whole area of Vancouver Wharves and uh, Fabrico where the uh, sawdust piles are and everything else. Right, right, right. That was all mud flats floated with crab, clams and everything else. So those all got destroyed as a result of the expansion. And so interesting. Uh, I'll spend my last 10 years from 93 to 2003 at Vancouver Wharves because part of it was on the reserve and I was working my last 10 years tax-free, mm -hmm. which makes a big difference on my pension mm -hmm. no tax forms now. Um, it was tax-free for you? Tax-free. It was on this Kepler reserve part of the dock. So all of us, in, was most, most, a lot of natives working there at the time. Mm. As a matter of fact, my partner when I started over there was from Chilliwac, mm -hmm. Earl Commodore. And he retired uh, with my other friend who died in eight, eight, or 2008, Dick Baker, uh, George Jacobs, uh, Gordon Jacobs. Jackie Lewis, so there were just all kinds of native people who, who, who they were blocks away from work. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the early days, uh, there were a long term from, from the Burrard Reserve at Tlaouta, as they call themselves today, on a dollar and highway. As a matter of fact, Dan George long short for a while. Okay. And his younger brother, John, and his older brother, Henry. I don't know exactly how many of them were. From there, it was about ten of them, I think. Uh, I can't think of all their names. I was just a kid when they, before they, but they did quit by the time I started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, did, were, they, were these generally replaced by their sons, or has it declined? The the the, the, the number of uh, the number of. Um, well, the father-son clause uh, sort of uh, disappeared. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, the only place it really works is with the uh, board of directors' sons. So you've got that kind of collusion going on mm -hmm. on the waterfront there too, which is unfortunate, but yeah. it's all part of life, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So your father was a longshoreman, you were a longshoreman, your yep. two sons are longshoremen. Yeah, my... Two of your sons. Two of my uh, sons. Four yeah. of them were actually for originally, and uh, through drinking, two of them got kicked out. Mm -hmm. Well, my my son, my second second son, uh, was fifty three, no, fifty one. In January, is it right? 1963. Anyhow, 
he was given the alternative either to go to a treatment center, uh, Maple Ridge, they is where they sent most of the guys in those years. Mm -hmm. They tried to send me there after I had uh, a little accident on the big cranes. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I'd, I'd sipped a couple of beers before going to work and everything, but uh, anyhow, with him though, uh, you know, he he didn't he didn't want to go to Maple Ridge, so he declined it and quit longshoring and started looking for other jobs. Then he ended up running our language program mm -hmm. down here, okay. because uh, he got a real interest in the language and uh, actually through working with a fellow uh, uh, professor from UBC, uh, Dave. Oh, his name is in my little phone book. Uh, But he worked with him at 16 years old uh, at the UBC, and uh, that would have been hmm, 86, I guess. Mm. Yeah, because uh, we took off and went down to Custer's last stand as a result of his discussion between him and Dave. But Dave had learned the language, the language south of Seattle. Then he moved up to Lummi Reserve, worked with them and uh, picked up their dialect, which is similar to ours. They, call, they, they name it a little differently. Then he moved to Saanich, and then to Cowichan, or Duncan, and he spoke their language and interestingly when my father-in-law passed away in 79 it was Abel Joe that this Dave was working with they actually developed the mass in the Indian so I don't know whether it was my wife or which probably her that came up with the idea of phoning Dave Abel Joe and getting, asking him to come over participate in the ceremony, and he did. And I remember listening to my dad uh, after the service is finished. Good God, he says, that, that white young white fellow, he speaks our, our, our language better than our people do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because our people's language has all become mixed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a really interesting story I mm -hmm. could tell you too, but uh, it's doesn't uh, really link to the longshoring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so is there another generation in your family you, you think is going to be longshoreman as well? I'm not sure. Uh, my oldest grandson uh, actually is working way out in Blundell and, well, number eight road I turned down. He's working on a dirt pile down there and uh, he may get on steady there. Uh, right now he's working out of Labor's Unlimited. Mm -hmm. His dad uh, and him, his dad really tended to start avoiding him because custody uh, started out as a battle and uh, he uh, and the woman, his grandson's mother, uh, she was challenging, she wanted to get custody of him, so we ended up going to court, and uh, we all had to write uh, little papers, and the judge, or magistrate, she said, okay, uh, I've studied the biography from the father and the mother, and the grandparents, and as far as I'm concerned, with the father and the mother, I won't give custody to either one of them. If the grandparents won't take him, he's going to uh, foster care. Mm -hmm. And he was two and a half years old at the mm -hmm. time. My wife just jumped up and said, we're taking him. Mm -hmm. And he'd been with us most of the time up mm -hmm. until then, anyhow. And uh, he'd become very close to me. And I kind of think this had some bearing on sort of the relationship between his, his him and he. His dad just sort of became kind of 
jealous of the attachment uh, mm -hmm. his grand his son had uh, taken to me yeah. and uh, he brought his second son who actually lives just over here uh, my son youngest son is split up from from that that lady as well he's with another lady now He's got two children there, so I've got four grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they were taking, enrolling people uh, in a process, he brought Taylor down with him. That's his, my second grand, grandchild, grandson. But they wouldn't take him because he was too young yet. Uh, mm -hmm. He wasn't 19 yet. Mm -hmm. But he wouldn't. He didn't take my. Didn't take Graham with him. He's Graham Jr. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, but Graham Jr. didn't have grade twelve either, and that's one of the mm -hmm. requirements today. Mm -hmm. Wasn't a requirement in the old days because mm -hmm. when I started, there were people there that couldn't couldn't uh, read or write. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It didn't really matter. But then a lot of it. You know, so much computerization's mm -hmm. taken place over the years. That's Just getting enrolled is not a guarantee anymore, anyway. No. Yeah. yeah. Um, and do you think your um, the your experience with the grandsons maybe not going on? Do you think that's the same for other um, uh, people you work with? Mm, I don't know. There are a lot of sons down there uh, mm -hmm. of. Uh, my generation and uh, actually younger generations mm -hmm. now, from what I hear, because I'm 75 now, and uh, so, like I say, the especially the ones uh, who are sons of the or daughters of the fellow the people that are on the on the board. Mm -hmm. They're getting moved, themselves moved into influence on the dispatchers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting, the first woman that uh, actually started on the Vancouver waterfront, uh, it was close to Christmas time, and when she came in and got registered, she was all wrapped up in heavy coat and everything else, and uh, dispatchers never realized she was... This, she was a, a lady, not a man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she was given her number, and then as the weather changed into the, into the springtime, she came in with uh, just re dressed regularly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she was she's quite. I don't know how she how she is today. She's about f f five two or five three somewhere around there. Oh, yeah. Very well endowed in the bus line, mm -hmm. and. Dispatcher saw that, and the business agent as well. So they deregistered her. Oh. Yeah. So she went to court. Uh, did she win? <laughs> yeah, she won. Oh, she got back in, and then from there, a lot of women started getting enrolled. Good. What year was that? Oh. Hmm. Probably sometime in the early 90s or somewhere around there. I can't, can't remember exactly. I was still working out of the dispatch hall then. Mm -hmm. So 93 when I started steady at North Vancouver and finished my last 10 years at the, on a Vancouver, dock called Vancouver Wars. And I don't know why they called it Vancouver Wars when it was on the North Shore. <laughs> right. Anyhow, it would be sometime in the early 90s, I think, when she got registered. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, f from my side, one final question is: where, of the of the people living on this reserve, um, were, were any of them working on the river in any kind of way? Canneries? Oh yeah, a lot of people. A lot of our people work in canneries. Can, can tell us tell us something about that? You know, well, they work. Where did they go? Yeah, they worked in the canneries. That uh, a lot of our people worked in the cannery. Uh, out in, on Surrey, the Kildella, no, not Kildella. Oh, what is it called? 
It's right close to where the uh, truck line is going through now. As a matter of fact, they found a midden there. One of our band members who worked there oh, yeah. found that midden because in 1951 or whatever it was, when the Fraser Arms was being installed, uh, Dr. Borden did his, a dig down there because they started finding uh, old wounds right away. Mm -hmm. So they held up uh, construction and uh, they're digging. Andrew Charles, our late Andrew Charles, our, one of our band members, became involved with him on that dig. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when the fishing season started up, he went to that canyon. Oh, what the hell? Uh, I, I always lose the name of it. Uh, sort of over in Annieville kind of area? In that area, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, it would be down. Quite a, way, quite a ways down from where the docks with the cranes are. Oh, okay. So more, um, almost Delta. Not quite Delta, Not no. Not quite Delta, no. okay. Uh, matter of fact, when you go over the uh, Alex Fraser Bridge, it was right in that area there where uh, you come off the Alex Fraser and if you go down to River Road. Okay. It was in that little area okay, there. Okay. And uh, matter of fact, Andrew Charles was working there and he sort of got some intuition feelings uh, and he went and started digging around and he started finding things, bones and uh, mm -hmm. artifacts there. Mm -hmm. So that was declared a uh, our official uh, historic area, right, right. same as just Nam down uh, in Marpole. I don't know if you heard about that fight we had down there, mm. where they were going to put in condos. Oh yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, discovered first first when was two two children dated uh, forty four hundred years old, mm -hmm. and then on the other end of it uh, they found two human two. Uh, Adult skeletons that dating back to 4,400 years ago. Wow. Mm. So we ended up in a big battle there, and we were down there protesting. I don't know how many how many days all together I spent down there. Yeah, mm. I became the crib crib champion down there. <laughs> <laughs> Just do things to do to pass the time away. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. got a little table and we'd be playing cards and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and every once in a while, I'd start singing. And then uh, gradually it got to a point where, with the singing, uh, people in the uh, condos uh, north of Marine Drive uh, started complaining to the police and everything, so mm -hmm. they, they put a 10 o'clock limit on the singing. Okay. Because people were staying there all night as well. Mm -hmm. And we had two marches from 70s and uh, Granville up the uh, Arthur Lang Bridge to stage where they climbed over the railing and mm. walked down the other side. St just totally disrupted traffic for mm -hmm. over over hour and a half, I guess, each mm. time. They did sure. two, the two times they did it. Is that settled? Yeah, we now own the property. Mm. The government uh, chipped in on it. Mm. I don't know exactly the exact details of the, de of the mm -hmm. whole agreement, but... Nevertheless, it's ours now. Mm -hmm. Whether you're still going to do what they talked about, make a park out of it, uh, was uh, part of the thought of members of the chief and council with the idea that uh, some signs would go up telling stories and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, uh, okay. But Do you have more, Peter? Of the reserves, uh, the Muskingum had very few longshoremen compared to uh, the Squamish Band and North Band. Sure, sure. Yeah. And actually, my uncle, my dad's oldest brother, did longshore in the uh, 20s when he, after he got married. Because uh, okay. his, his wife was from, actually, their family in their early, early years lived on the Capilano Reserve. Yeah. And then somehow government enfranchised him. 
so they were no longer bad members. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, when they first got married, uh, somehow he got into longshoring. So you've said this many times today. When you get married, you start longshoring. Why? Why do those two go together? To survive and feed them. <laughs> okay. Feed the family. And it's it just because it's a better job than fishing, or? Well, it's year round. Uh, whereas fishing, fishing in the early days, uh, season went from oh mid May, the really increased in June. And went right through to the end of October. Mm -hmm. Then as time went on, and it started shortening and shortening and shortening. And as I say, uh, when I uh, decided I had to quit, we were down to three days a week sometimes in Rivers Inlet. Yeah, yeah. And uh, f f majority of the soccer season was four days. Mm -hmm. But we were still getting paid for the full month, like. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, you could see the in the background what was going to be gradually happening and uh, it actually did get to a stage where it you know deteriorated to a point where a lot of people just sold their licenses yeah yeah I still got mine mm -hmm. my son that younger son uses it actually but uh, no that just shortened up because of the modernization of the gear and everything else that yeah, yeah. took place over the years. The interesting thing uh, on the ice question you were asking earlier, the first uh, packer that uh, had tanks in it was a, a BC Packers packer named the JRD. Okay. And it was interesting because we delivered our fish to him and uh, the tanks were still in there and there Water would, he'd have water in them and uh, fish would be thrown into there. I finished washing down our hatches and everything and the decks and whatnot. And I looked over and the old skipper, I can't remember his name, was sitting in the cabin and looking really down, sad looking. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to go over and talk to him. Maybe we can cheer him up a bit. So I went over and I said, all right, I like I said, I, I knew his name at the time, but I can't yeah. remember it now. My other friend that uh, was there at the same time, he was running my uncle's other fish collector, and uh, he can't remember it either. I, we were at the, our elder's lunch, and I asked him, oh, geez, no, I can't remember either. Anyhow, I go in, and I say, gee, this is the fastest uh, packer of all the packers. You know, JRD, the only one I see that's kind of close to it is the Betty L. It was owned by BC Packers too, and both of them, the hulls kind of looked like the shape of a canoe. Oh, okay. Oh, heck, he says. Compared to when I first started running this thing when I was a young fellow, he says it's slow now. Mm. What do you mean? Well, back then it had four engines in it. Was well, the Coast Guard and the Canada side or the U.S. side could catch me? <laughs> <laughs> Prohibition days down the states. Right. <laughs> Then uh, he told me about the different people up here that were involved in it, and there were five manufacturing uh, breweries along Marine Drive, mm -hmm. the Casamia, one of the houses along there. Uh, okay. They're now trying to change into a boarding facility for, I think it's for elders. Mm -hmm. I saw something like that. Yeah. 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 That and was a that was a brewery. The, there were five breweries along there wow. with mm -hmm. tunnel tunnels. Going down to the water, that, uh, <coughs> the assumption is those tunnels were dug by our people uh -huh. because our people on this side and the island side had a lot of tunnels that they built, dug, dug, uh, in order to be able to hide their our people when the northerners came down uh -huh. and ran, ransacking and uh, actually uh, kidnapping children mm -hmm. and ladies. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Yeah, and he says, well, he, he named the Rogers family, the family that, uh, well, I can't think of their name right now. They built the Lionsgate Bridge. Oh, the, the, the Guinness family. Guinness family. The, and uh, 
British properties. They bought British properties mm -hmm. for thirty-seven thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, heads of different, all the different fishing companies were all involved. Then he says, "You know who the biggest buyer was down in the states?" I said, "Who?" Joe Kennedy. <laughs> Both on the Pacific coast and the Atlantic coast. <laughs> so that's how they became multimillionaires. <laughs> oh, I laughed to myself when he told me that part. <laughs> Especially later on, Jack becomes president of the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his brother, then they both get killed. Mm. Murdered. Yeah, it was interesting over the years, all the different things you learned uh, about development of the you know, the country. Sure, sure. And uh, what really interested me was working with a lot of Europeans. Uh, we'd get talking and everything. I never learned my language because, uh, as it turned out, my sister asked, she's nine years younger than me, but a couple of years before my dad, our dad died, she asked him, how come you never taught Beverly or Delbert the language or Glenn or I? She's nine years, he was 11 years younger than me, the younger brother. He's gone now. He just put his hands out and all the scars on his hands and everything. I thought it was from all the hard work because he started, my mother actually, or grandmother actually had him washing fish in Vancouver, Canada, which was on the uh, south side of Sea Island, right across from number one okay. road. And she made a little uh, stand for him where he could get up and wash the fish. Well, he wasn't getting paid much, but at least he was doing something. That's your father? Yeah. So he, he started in the cannery as well? Yeah. Same, same as you in some ways? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he moved up, and I don't know what year he bought his first gill netter, or his gill netter. And he started uh, going to Rivers Inlet because, actually speaking, when the fishing industry started in 1888, they wouldn't allow native people to be commercial fishermen. And uh, my grandfather was a half-breed. His father was an Irishman. And uh, he, his, their mother died when my grandfather was eight years old. His brother was 10, two years older than him. And they were the first half-breeds born in this reserve. And they were getting nothing after, particularly after their mother died, they were getting Nothing but a rough time from the uh, full bloods. Mm -hmm. So my wife's, or my, his bro older brother went one way, started learning family trees and finding out all kinds of dirt about the different family lines and everything else. And my grandfather, uh, four years later, after his mother died, at 12 years old, moved to, to Steveston and lived there doing anything he could to make money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he got married in, I assume 1900, because he's, or 1901, because he's, their oldest son was uh, born in 1902. And then the other brother that died uh, at a young age was born in 1903. Then my other uncle Chris was born in 1905, and my dad 1907. All boys, no girls in the their family. But that was the reason that we, we weren't taught the language. And by the time he started trying to teach me, I couldn't. Uh, I, I found out after some some time after I went for your ear test, and to low guttural sounds, I have a deafness. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So I wasn't able to pronounce the words fully because the guttural sounds usually were at the end of words. And mm -hmm. He was trying to teach me a particular word and I couldn't get it right and he got cranky with me. I'm not gonna teach you anymore. Mm -hmm. I'll teach Victor and I'll teach your mother, your Fran, that's my wife. They can pick up the words. Mm -hmm. And my wife actually was the one who initiated the idea of having a language program here in 74, I guess, was when she first tried it. Uh, one of our elders involved with the kids and uh, actually going to Southlands. And then the problem that uh, that uh, caused were Ed Sparrow, the first fellow that uh, 
she engaged to try and teach them. Ended up mostly white kids coming in, white mm -hmm. students coming in. And the Indian children just went for a couple of sessions and then just lost interest mm -hmm. because when they went home, they couldn't. Uh, their parents didn't, couldn't speak it either. So mm -hmm. because of all the treatment they received in level residential school, our parents weren't teaching any of our younger, mm -hmm. well, my my generation, the language. Mm -hmm. right. The only one, a few of them that uh, did learn were, as a result, matter of fact, of, uh, in some cases where parents hadn't gone to school at all mm -hmm. and taught their children and spoke to them in the language all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas when, as I say, we lived in North Mandel, I was 15 years old, and there was no running water or electricity on this reserve until 1949. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beside the third largest city in Canada, yeah. mm -hmm. so my dad used to come over because when he built his house up in Marine Drive, he dug a well that was, I would say, a little deeper than this room, and uh, it was good for a while. And in '38, as a matter of fact, there's a picture up in my daughter and wife's office of uh, Dunbar. It goes up about above 37th. And Commotion St Street is not there yet, where uh, it goes up the hill beside Southland School, right. to, to St. David's School. Crown Street was there. It looks like 37th to me. There's two houses left there only, and not too many houses, I guess, up the hill. Sure. But as time progressed and the houses uh, started increasing, that water and that well became polluted. Mm -hmm. So my dad used to come over to get fresh water from the gas station for my grandmother and grandfather to drink. So I was coming over with them all the time. Mm -hmm. But they would speak in their language all the time together. But as soon as they wanted us to do something or anything, they would only speak to us in English. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just didn't fathom why. You know, and didn't that think, you know, too young to think to ask those any kind of questions. Mm -hmm. so. But little, you know, like I was starting to say, talking to different people from different European countries, uh, it was so interesting. A Frenchman I was talking to, he was talking about how in southwest France to northeast France, yeah. they, they had problems talking to each other, mm -hmm. and vice versa. On the other two corners, uh, mm -hmm. and the other countries uh, surrounding them are all having, because their dialects were all getting mixed on the uh, edges of their uh, border lines. Mm -hmm. Because uh, our language basically roughly goes to Vancouver Island from Nanus Bay down to Saanich and uh, up the valley. But interestingly, the upriver people call the language Halkamilam, with the two L's in it. Island people call it Halkaminam. Our people say Hunkominam. Mm -hmm. Our people didn't develop L's into the language. Uh, and when my wife's grandfather was teaching our family, wife family trees, because she was our secretary uh, for the band for quite a few years, and I would assume he got an impression of how good she was at writing. Mm -hmm. So he decided to come and teach her family trees when he got into his 90s. And uh, she's got it all written down and everything and uh, put away, but... He told her it was private documentation. She was only allowed to share it with certain uh, people to help them out with the part that involved them and everything else. So there's a lot of tapes there, and basically, I've got one of the tapes that I wanted. I, I want to get around to burning it on the CD so that uh, she's safe. She well, she can happens to be in the truck. I'll put it into the machine and uh, <laughs> let her hear. And then maybe she'll bring out the rest of them for me to be able to do, because i got a burner at the house. Right. It can, I can put the tape into there and burn it. Mm -hmm. So you um, you talked about language with some of the people that you work with. You talked to sailors? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
Matter of fact, we had one fellow, uh, I don't remember his name either, but that man could speak three, 13 different languages worldwide. Wow. He started sailing at 13 years old from what country I can't remember, but he learned all the different ships that he'd worked on, and he learned all these different languages. He'd get onto certain ships, Chinese ships, for example, he'd be talking their language to them, just rattling on back and forth together. And uh, and he ended up as a longshoreman? Mm-hmm. But various ships that came in was different from different nationalities. He was able to converse with a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing with... Uh, multilingual per- person like that. Sometimes he'd go for coffee and there'd be 20 of us down the hatch on some of these ships. Yeah. He never made a list. Came back, you wanted a black coffee? You wanted mm-hmm. a coffee cream, no sugar, and blah, 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 a donut. And never made a mistake. You had change coming. And mm-hmm. Wow. It just amazed me uh, watching him uh, to realize Multilingualism must assist yeah. a person in that uh, memory business. Right, right, right. Well, that's great. I think I've covered what I need to. I don't have anything further. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for your time. Mm-hmm.